Hey Jacob, it's good to chat with you this morning. So uh, you had some interesting things that you brought up to really spur this little talk, but I just want to get a little bit of background for you for our audience that may not be familiar with you. Uh, so my name is Jacob Wolf. I am a reporter, feature writer, graphic designer, and video producer at The Daily Dot. Uh, I've been at The Daily Dot since April. Before that, I was uh, working in Esports Heaven and Gfinity and doing freelance work at Goal for 10. Uh, ultimately was reached out to by The Daily Dot and my current boss in Richard Lewis uh, and decided to join on there. I focus mainly on League of Legends, Counter-Strike, and Super Smash Bros. I've played Smash since 2002. Uh, and play mainly Melee and 4 with a little bit of Project M uh, in there as well. So, What are uh, some of the works you've done for the Daily Dot to give more context? Uh, pertaining to Smash. Daily... Uh, pertaining to Smash specifically, I'm sorry. Okay. So uh, in terms of Smash at the Daily Dot, uh, I think... My first big one, uh, I did a feature with Esam called Meet Esam, the best Smash 4 Pikachu in the world. Uh, this was pre-Evo. Uh, it was basically about like his thoughts on custom moves and like upcoming custom move uh, custom moves being enabled at Evo. Uh, and just Pikachu as a character uh, in like 4 and Brawl, since he's significantly different than he is in Melee. Um, I also, after that I did uh, Winter Fox Shroomed, got a chance to talk to the Winter Fox guys. Uh, we had a freelance reporter come in that does stuff with the Daily Dot from now and then, and he had information about this. Uh, and I had already spoken to them about doing like an official release, so we, we compiled together and did one big release between him and I. Uh, a couple weeks after that I did uh, the TSM Zero piece, the Liquid Nairo piece, the VQ to Buzz piece, and most recently I've done DreamHack London to be at Super Smash Bros. Melee, or at a, eh, uh, Super Smash Bros. Melee to be at DreamHack London, and Westfall is dropping out of HTC to go to DreamHack. So. It's kind of crazy because you mentioned that you played you know, on and off for years. Did you ever imagine that these people like Team Liquid or DreamHack... Winter Fox, EG, Cloud9, we're going to get into Smash if we were to chat about this three years ago? Uh, I had a feeling it would eventually come just because uh, Smash is one of the... It's one of the fighting games that is really interesting and like relatable because a lot of the generation... Uh, the generation of these owners who are mostly in their 30s and late 20s and... Uh, now like my generation uh as well like we all grew up playing nintendo games so like everybody can relate to to like melee so i, I feel i know i've spoken to a specific owner of an organization that uh, owns a league team and he really wants to get into melee because it was like his favorite thing to do as a child and he still like plays it a lot right now and he's like fascinated by it so i think it was like an eventual move but i'm i'm glad it's happened as it has so yeah it's kind of funny because on and off, um, when the LCS isn't happening, I get to play Melee and Smash 4 with people from the LCS. So it's kind of interesting to yeah. see everything integrate itself. Um, so, you know, we've had a lot of growth, and I, I did a little bit of a piece of the history of a lot of organizations really coming in. Uh, we had Game Unicon, we had Active Gamers, these, these big corporations that came in they didn't pay out, um, they cheated players. And I know that you've seen your fear of drama with League of Legends. There was a MYM, MYM incident in Europe where the guy was threatening his players. And we saw, we've seen a lot of abusive owners, abusive organizations really try to swoop in. So what do you think about that as we um, get into Smash and its growth? Uh, I think it's something that is going to actually occur a little bit more often now that more people are getting into Smash Bros. Uh, with like, with DreamHack coming in, and I'm not saying that DreamHack is going to do them themselves, but uh, with more more tournament organizers embracing it and paying out more money, like a thirty thousand dollar prize pool at DreamHack Winter, uh, it's going to become a more attractive commodity for organizations. 
And the problem with a lot of esports organizations is that all the people that run them are very young. Mm. Um, and so overall, you're going to have you're going to have your few like uh, Liquid and TSM and like Cloud9 and Winterfox that usually don't have a problem with any sort of payment, uh, just because they're like they're big corporations. They they keep tons of money on hand. They make tons of money off streaming and merchandise and. Like they they'll never have a problem, but I'm I'm sure we'll see more that want to embrace the industry and are a little bit in over their heads, and then we'll just see some of the people that are straight scumbags, which unfortunately happens in League of Legends, and it happens a lot in the challenger scene, which is like semi-professional, uh, just because the barrier to entry is a lot lower, so you have people that come in that just don't know what they're doing. So, right. So it seems just overall that the landscape. Um, isn't really set. We're not an established industry. It kind of reminds me of startups where, you know, some of them do pan out to do really well, the TSMs and Cloud9s, and there are certain groups that will startups fail and they're not going to pan out. Um, what are, I guess if you could give me some short summaries, what has happened in the other scenes that you could give some background to that the Melee scene could expect just on history? Uh, so obviously... The Meet Your Makers thing is, is the big one within the last year that has happened and is, like, really, really shitty. Uh, it, for people that don't know, uh, Marcin Walski, Corey, it was their mid laner, is their mid, or is at the time, like, was at the time, uh, and he left weeks or, like, four or five days before the start of the, the split, and... Uh, he flew to North America, flew to Canada to play for another team, a uh, semi-pro team, and left his team out to dry. Well, it, com- it comes out later that he was verbally abused by his manager, and uh, even more so, he was never, once he returned, he was forced to return by Riot, and he was never play- or never paid for that whole entire split because Riot fined his organization $5,000 for verbal abuse, and his organization took that out on him and didn't pay him. Wow. So, yeah, this is like a 17-year-old kid who com- got completely screwed. And, you know, like, the thing is with with League, and it, it's it's bad in League, and it's probably even worse in Smash Bros, just because there's not a lot of good organizations in the industry yet, like big organizations that have that security uh, and know better than to screw someone over because they know the consequences that they did. Um, but when you see dollar signs for playing video games, it's it's pretty often that you're just going to sign with it uh, and not really know what you're signing into. And the more, like at this point, we're, we're past the whole like equipment and like flight sponsorships. We've got people that are coming in with actual money and throwing actual money at, at people instead of just benefits. So... It's gonna happen more. Uh, just need to be very, very cautious. If you're a player, you need to be very cautious of what you're signing into, and you definitely need to like read your contracts over multiple times. And I urge you, if you have it at your disposal, show the contracts to a lawyer because oftentimes these organizations uh, write their own contracts, so they they don't have a lawyer. So who knows what could be in that contract? Usually, those kind of contracts favor. The organization over the player right so um you just have to be really cautious basically what are um so smashers smashers don't really have money to begin with and they're expected to go to a lawyer which i highly recommend but what are some of the common red flags that you've seen in contracts where it's like okay this is really bad for the player um do you know of some typical trends yes i do actually i've had a chance to, to write on a few so uh I don't think it's a bigger thing in Smash, but it, it may turn out to pan out like this. So in League, a common thing that's not in contract that I've seen a few lawyers that have written it in uh, contracts for their clients, which I actually really like, is uh, the whole poaching thing. So um, basically, when or organizations have to, you have to approach uh, in or- another organization if you want their player you can't go to the player directly uh, and there are times when the uh, there's times when like one organization owner will go to another and offer buyout money and then the player will never know that happened um, 
There was a player on CLG that was on their semi-pro team that I got a chance to write about this. Uh, he had three different teams approach his organization with $10,000 buyout offers, and he never even knew about it until he started asking around himself because he had a feeling that people like were looking for him, and he found out that they were, but he was never told about it. Mm. So, and his team has made it nowhere this year, whereas all the team or two of the teams that have offered him have done extremely well. So. Mm. Um, when, so obviously when, a you know, big team that's already, you know, already has that reputation, they say like the cloud nines and the TSMs, you know, they had a his they have a history of doing well with other esports. but what do you say to, you know, a player that's approached by like an up and coming organization and to leverage the up and coming organization says, we'll pay you a little bit of extra money just because we don't have much of a reputation and they start approaching and having these talks. Um, what do you suggest to that player um, as they're negotiating? You have to be really careful with a lot of those organizations. There's a few that uh, I've ran into, and they're, like, super nice people. Uh, some of them are really, really bad in terms of contracts. Others are really, really good. Uh, and you just don't really know because there is, like you said, there is no reputation for some of these people. Um, but they have the money. Uh, you, you just have to be really careful. You have to be really cautious on what the contract terms are. You have to read the contract terms. And overall, you just have to like, you have to feel it out. And it's if you think there's anything that's, like, indifferent, that, like, doesn't kind of feel right, uh, ask around. Cause there's always, like, I know several, like, casters and tournament organizers that approach me, and they'll say, hey, we have, like, X player in our region, and he was approached by, like, Y organization. What do you know about these people? Uh, are they worth him putting his name on that contract and, and signing with them and representing them? So it's always good to ask around before you sign with someone that's uh, a little bit less known because that kind of gives you the assurance that you, uh, you're you not signing into something that could potentially fuck you over. So. Right. Um, it, it almost feels like, you know, for Smash, we've been the underprivileged kids and now we're, like, getting the first opportunity. It's... Um, I live in LA, so I see very similar trends with my friends who freelance in Hollywood that they just jump on any opportunity, whether it's an abusive relationship or they're not going to get paid at all or barely anything. So um, do you have any advice for a person that just like gets really excited? Do they just wait it out? Do they you know, field offers? Because I remember um, you know, Zero mentioned in his video yeah. that he didn't settle right away on one, and I feel the worry that I have is... Oh, I'm. I can make. I'm sponsored as if like that title is good, and sponsorships are very widely. So, what do you tell a player that may have gone his first deal or offer uh, to like kind of shop around? Like, what's the shopping around advice that you'd give? It, it's to see who all approaches you. It's also about uh, kind of letting people know that you're like interested because if you're just playing, then. You may, like I've had organizations ask me about certain players and what I think of them. Uh, and yeah, like that, that overall seems to, it seems to be like a good thing to kind of wait it out. I know Zero specifically had offers from, he had offers from bigger organizations uh, in other games. Uh, TSM was the best that he got out of everything, which is why he took it. Uh, he also had a offer from an organization uh, named Coast, who are uh, historically pretty. I, I won't say I won't like smear them and say that they're like totally awful, but they, like even right now, they're kind of having a falling out between management, and it's over like someone took money from someone else, and someone else didn't do his duty, and it's like these very minute things. But when they're all piled into one big like one big manifest like everything's pretty bad so uh it, and zero was close to signing with them too that yeah. was like his first serious offer before uh signing with tsm and i'm really glad he didn't uh i'm sure someone along the lines advised him please don't do that uh which is good and yeah you, you just have to be really careful and you just like ask around that's honestly the best thing you can do is when you're shopping, ask everyone you or like ask about who you're talking to because somewhere, someone in esports has had to deal, deal with those kind of people before. So, mm -hmm. but like, just ask your friends. Like, hell, if you're a player, like tweet me. There's like 
probably a chance I'll know. So, and if I don't, I can ask someone who does. Mm. So, just just be very open about it to certain people that you trust, and yeah, just because you, it's better to to be open about a situation and figure out what's going on than to get screwed over. So right, and we get to the cases where you know over the years I have seen some awful signings. It kind of reminds me of an abusive just like relationship between like two significant others where you kind of look at them and you look and like something seems off like they're quiet or they have Stockholm syndrome of some sort where like um, it's like they know you can tell something's up but they're not willing to admit it or they justify everything so what do you really do when you see a friend or a person that you know from the scene like you can tell something's wrong but like um, but you aren't quite sure but you you're pretty sure that something's up uh, I honestly like and I'm, I'm pretty different from other people in terms of this issue so when I see something that's going on that's pretty uh, pretty out of the uh, ordinary I believe that you should just go ahead and speak up uh, I find it pretty what's the word uh, unproductive not to so it's way better to just open your mouth and they'll probably thank you down the road if if you did the right thing so I I wouldn't have fear over like making someone upset like, <laughs> if if you're saving their well being like no fear at all so. right you just like zoomed in as that happened so it looked really I, ominous I know my camera I don't know I have like a camera utility tool and it completely screwed me and zoomed in and I was just like uh oh well I think the scary thing overall out of all this and you know it's not just the bad news because like. Thirty thousand prize dollar prize pod stream hack. You know they're really kick ass things for the community, um, but I think like you mentioned, um, it, it is going to be kind of scary to see friends and acquaintances that I've known to love as family um, possibly get cheated and you know have their lives ruined for a while. Um, so, do you have any closing thoughts on what's what lies ahead in terms of a more let's be cautious route? Um, well, obviously, like, the more people come in, the more people are going to throw money around. And money is attractive for any player, especially since a lot of these players are young. Uh, and, yeah, you just have to be, like, have to be cautious. You have to, like, watch out for yourself. You need to ask around to people that know if you don't know. And, yeah, like, it, you could easily just get screwed over and it wouldn't matter. And oftentimes, I, I think now that, uh, now that we at the Daily Dot are really – like trying to help push the community in terms of content, I think that it will probably take one or two fuck ups, and somebody will, an organization will do something wrong to a player, or vice versa, and it will be publicized, and yeah. that will be like the the fire warning for everyone else. Like, if you do anything incorrectly, like there's a good chance that it's going to be public, and there's a lot of accountability there. But unfortunately, we're we're reaching the point where like those two fuck ups or so are going to happen kind of soon. So. And a handful of people's lives are going to get screwed over. Yep. Which is unfortunate. Um, all right. Do you have any um, shout outs or anything that you want to um, say before we close? Uh, shout outs to the Daily Dot. Uh, shout outs to my mentor, Richard Lewis, who just left doing written work uh, yesterday, or, or will be leaving, rather. He announced that he is leaving. Yeah. Uh, and so thank you for everything he's done for me. Thank you for everything the Daily Dot's done for me. Uh, for live broadcasting for Smash, uh, Daily Dot Esports does it every Thursday. We do an AMMA with R slash Smash Bros. Uh, and you can find it at twitch.tv slash the, or no, twitch.tv slash Daily Dot. So. Alrighty, sounds great. Uh, thank you for coming on. Um, it was an honor to chat with you. Likewise, man. Thank you for having me on.